Welcome back, Wind Against Tiders. We're coming at you after a fantastic long weekend of fishing. Joey and I got up to Bermagui to fish the Alliance Game Fishing Tournament, our first forte foray into the comp- competitive fishing world. Uh, we had an absolute ball. We were nowhere near winning, but boy, did we have a lot of fun. Uh, and Joey. D- Dave, uh, yeah, congratulations and uh, congratulations to Marley's Marine as well for uh, entering us into uh, our first uh, Marlin competition. I, the last time I'd been in a fishing competition personally was back when I was a young fella catching carp at the Caribbean Gardens Market. So, um, oh, no, I've been in tea tree. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, I won't let did, the truth get in the way of a good story. But I did forget about tea tree. Yeah. <laughs> Game fishing tournament, I should Game say. Game fishing, absolutely. No, it was a fantastic uh, weekend. And, yeah, just Bermagui, what a beautiful place. We, we just don't get up there as much as we'd like to. No, we'd love to get up there more. So basically um, my work place, uh, we sent a demo boat up and uh, myself and my colleagues and I smuggled Joe aboard, uh, got up to Bermagui, we sponsored the tournament and we fished in it and we had an absolute ball. Uh, but we might talk a little bit about that in more detail later because on the line, Joseph, we have... The winner of the Alliance Tag and Release Game Fish Tournament for 2024, Team Pandemonium, Rodney Gillum. The grand champion. Here he is. Woo! How are you doing? G'day, guys. How are we? <laughs> I, I, I had to pinch myself to stop laughing at you, Joey, talking about the Caribbean Gardens fishing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, we've all got to start somewhere, don't we? We do. Oh, that's it. That's it. So, Rodney. Yep. Tell us a little bit about the Alliance Game Fishing Tournament because you are actually president of the Latrobe Valley Game Fishing Club and that is one of three clubs competing. Sounds like an alliance to me, an alliance of yeah, game fishing Yeah, it's an alliance. Clubs. I'm actually vice president, Dave, Arthur Cunningham's prezi, but, oh, um, sorry, Arthur. but Christine and I... I've dethroned nah, Arthur. Yeah, no. Nah. King Arthur. No, let's <laughs> <it's, laughs> put him back on. But um, yeah, Christine and I sort of help support the committee of the alliance so you know having mully's marine come on this year we haven't had a whole heap of corporate interest um in the tournament but certainly you guys put your hand up and joined sort of um Bermagui bait and tackle and shimano in being the major sponsors for the tournament so so it was fantastic obviously the, the build up to the comp was good there was a big bite earlier in the week um, I had good mate and a good supporter of of your show, Richie Abella, come out with us on the Monday, and we got really hot on a really good bite. Um, with not much boat traffic, and really capitalised. So, you can say how many we caught, Dave. Um, I might get it wrong. Was it twelve? Is that <laughs> thirteen? Right? So thirteen. <laughs> See? Yeah, thirteen. <laughs> thirteen <laughs> from. No, that's all right. Thirteen from twenty shots. Yeah. 20 shots, yeah. We got them on lures, we got them on the switch, and we got them on bait balls. It was just one of those days that you dream about and it'll probably take a while for it to sink in. Which, to put um, into sp- but, perspective, but yeah. that's the second highest amount of fish tagged in one day off Bermagui ever. I've heard from boats launching out of that port, yep. I've heard 14's the number. Yep, absolutely yep. crazy. So that was your pre-fish. And uh, yep. you went into the tournament, yeah, hot, pre- hot favourites after that. Well, it's funny you say because we did a pretty poor pre-fish on the Friday where we did donuts out at the bait hole and um, we tried a couple of different things and clearly didn't work. So once we got our crew together for the the tournament, we actually went further south. We went down to a mark. We'd got some fish on the Thursday down at Tarthra Canyons and um, we got got on a pretty good bite down there where we went – Missed the first fish and then we got the next five that we raised on the switch and on lures, um, which was enough to give us a two two fish lead on day one. Fantastic. And your young fellow, Nico, who's uh, becoming a real gun fisherman, he was uh, he, he won, didn't he? He won a junior, uh, the junior tag and release section. He did, yeah. Look, he did well the first day. He um he got two fish on on lures, and then he switched one 
to a livey as well and got three fish for the day and by the, the stage he got his third fish it was getting pretty rough i said mate you're done but <laughs> but that was his record he, he got three on the monday when richie was on and that his previous record for a day was two so he's only 12 years old and 38 kilos but his stamina on the rod is really good and his balance um because in the tournaments unless there's there's danger to the angler you're not really meant to be grabbing onto the kids so he had to do it alone we we probably could have supported him a couple of times in, in the rough and the wet but you know we try to let him sort of do his thing yeah so from our perspective we actually got up there on thursday night uh and rodney had i think was coming in late he they got four that day and we yep. actually had organized accommodation but originally weren't going up on thursday night so Rodney was very kind and allowed us to sleep on board the beautiful vessel Pandemonium, <laughs> which is a... I saw you bunk it up there for the night. Which is a beautiful big Maritimo <laughs> living in the uh, Bermagui Marina. So uh, thank you very much for that, Rodney. It was well, it was funny the next morning we, we, we got on the boat pretty early to fish and you guys had already left the building. It was, yeah, it was pretty quiet on board. So yeah. you guys were keen. Yeah, it was Scott snoring that woke us up, so we were out of there. <laughs> Horrendous, isn't it? <laughs> no, I actually didn't hear it. I was out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely need the earplug plugs on board when he's around. <laughs> um, but Sorry, Scotty. <laughs> we we actually went out on the Friday, and it must have been from, uh, from touching the boat a few times because we actually had quite a good day ourselves, which was pleasantly pleasantly surprising and I was quite happy with that after not having marlin fish for a few years to be right back on the pace there and uh, going a seven uh seven six five for the day um probably nearly seven six six but that's right we won't count one of them so yeah we were straight mm. back on the pace and we were really happy with that well, you had a double didn't you we did we had doubles we had singles we had Stuff going everywhere. So um, just myself and and Reno, my colleague, out in the seven two five Haynes, in in the rough stuff. So we're pretty happy to come out, away with that. It's pretty elite fishing, isn't it? Just to roll up there and not a fish for a couple of years, and you know, tag five fish. That you know, that's right up there. Yeah, but as I said to everyone yeah. back in port, like we've just used our luck up and. Turns out the next day, even though we were fishing around tournament winners pandemonium, we did not raise a single fish for the day. I don't. That even, was unbelievable. Yeah. I don't even know how it's possible. I just kept looking over on me, and you were, you guys were backing down <laughs> on, on fish, and it just became a bit ridiculous after a while. I don't know you, you definitely need to put a bit more heat on, and just come over and sort of troll in our spread. And, <laughs> Chop a few lures off. <laughs> we should have got closer, Dave. That's exactly right. Well, I actually did suggest that. I said I, we should just park ourselves in his spread and act as a giant teaser, and then we'll just raise the mm. fish to our boat. Like, I mean, look up on your screen now, that beautiful 725 Haynes. She's a great vessel, Joey. So, I mean, absolutely privileged that the, the boss man set that boat up for us. It had um, – it's packed full of extras. He, he actually kept saying to me, oh, do we want this? Do we want that? And I'm like, oh, man, you – you're going pretty crazy with this. I think there was, he got a bit excited. So we had um, a few of the extras we had were uh, foam flooring, uh, leaning leaning posts, which was really handy. It's got night vision, underwater oh, wow. lights, uh, obviously outriggers, slimy tubes, um, also an uh, amazing sound system and the, the big twin Suzuki's on the back there. So And, yeah, and a, Mully's Marine is actually the new home of Haynes Hunter for down the peninsula. It isn't is, it? Joe. It is. Yeah. yeah, It's a celebration. Yes. It's not a paid ad, but yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a paid ad, but it sure sounded like one. Yeah. Yeah, so no, that's going very well. Yeah. So we were, I was very, very lucky that I've been able to head up there for work and um, wonderful to be a part of that competition, Rodney. Yeah, and you ended up getting pretty hot on the last day anyway, Dave. You raised quite a number of fish and tagged a couple as well. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we had um we had another six six bites on or six raised six on the on the Sunday, so that was really good. I don't know what happened on yeah. Saturday, but um that was the anomaly. <laughs> mm. And you got Jake and his father on their first marlin. Yeah, that was very very special moment, father and son to um. Have captured that marlin together. They were absolutely stoked. So it's always a privilege to be a part of those of those moments. So Rodney, what? Yep, yep. 
What was the uh, the tournament winning method? We're going to delve into all your secrets now. <laughs> yeah, it's a it, it's a hard one. It's a matter of just sticking to what sort of works for you. But we were running a couple of lures and a couple of teasers, and we ended up getting probably half our catch on lures, half on the switch, either switching to skippies or to live bait. Um, so that seemed to be the program that worked during the week, and it just depends on your crew, like. You know, when we had Richie on board, we were able to switch them pretty good. And, um, yeah, we had a bit of luck through the tournament as well with it. So we, we just stuck with that. I mean, there's obviously times where you might want to throw some liveys in or do some other things, but we just try to stick to the program. And the key to it, I think, is just finding the area and sticking at the area. I think sometimes where you travel around too much, you sort of don't get on it. And I think... We saw that with you on Sunday. We found you late in the day and you guys just had your little honey hole that you, you were working sort of sideways with the current and um, that seemed to be what worked for a lot of the boats that were raising plenty of fish. Yeah, 100%. And probably where we went wrong on Saturday is we probably got a bit carried away running too far to the south and then um, kind of jumped over the productive or well, what was productive for us, that area anyway, but rectified mm. on the Sunday. Hey, what do you think about the anti-lure trolling stigma that surrounds striped marlin in Australia? Because uh, I know we've had this conversation before where it's almost if you catch a striped marlin on a lure, you're not cool. But I know that you've actually, mm. you've defied the odds and you are very successful with your lure trolling, Rodney. Is there a secret to that? Yeah, well, it's funny. On the Monday, we with Rich on board, we were one from one. Then we were one from three on lures and then we were three from five on lures and like Richie tried, you know, we ran the skippy for for an hour or two and it wasn't it getting eaten as well well as the lures and we ended up leaving the skippy behind and sticking with the lure program. But um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I noticed after our 13 fish day there were crews that normally are tried and true skippy trollers that did maybe switch their program around a bit but yeah the hookup rates were probably not perfect but uh, i think we ended up six from nine from what richie had counted on the monday uh, we just run a, a single hook and um, depending on the gauge of the hook you will affect sort of what sort of drag pressure you'll have not your lighter gauges you might only have say four to five kilo drag and maybe your heavier gauge hook you might you know, around about six or seven. So, so mostly as light and, gauge hooks are designed to penetrate, but they open up at about five kilo, would you say, pressure? Oh, no, no I think you can run them a bit more. Yep. Um, just depends on which which light gauge. I mean, we've we've played around with the, the type of hooks we use and we've sort of settled on a couple of brands at the moment. Um. Yeah, so it's it's one of those things. The good thing with the lures too, you can you can tease the fish onto the lure and feed him as well. And yeah, it's one of those things. I mean, ideally, you want to get hook a fish on a circle, but by incorporating the switch program into our spread, like we're able to get a bit of both. And I think the day we got the thirteen, I think we got five on the switch as well. So yep. probably our numbers were again roughly half and a half funny because on sunday when we had pretty bad ratios we actually caught um we had two bites on the lures landed the second one and then mm. um i was like no nah, we'll switch to skip baits and then once we ran skip baits we actually we got one from another four another three another f three or four fish anyway so our skip bait hookup was actually probably worse than the lure hookup on that day which is a little bit unusual, but um, yeah, supports what you're saying. Yeah, and and I suppose the thing with striped marlin is, unlike a say a blue marlin or, or a tuna, which tend to crash tackle the lure, um, and engulf the lure, and that leads to a better hookup. Striped marlin, uh, we those that have caught them will have seen that they come up on a lure or skip bait, and they're directly behind it generally, and mm. they're trying to eat it um, from directly behind, which obviously makes it harder for the hook to bury and find uh, and find a, a secure spot. So running those lighter gauge hooks. And I think, <clears throat> yeah, go on. Yeah, sorry. I think that's where if your crew are really sharp, like if he's coming up from behind and 
trying to eat it from behind, that's where you can pop it out of the clip or run your roller trollers and bring him up a bit closer to the boat for the switch or maybe then you can turn him off that one and maybe come inside out onto the other rigger. We like we had that happen a couple of times where they might knock one out of one rigger and then shoot across and hit the other one sideways. Um, so it's all about being on the ball and like having good electronics as well. We're running Furuno TZ. Chirp technology, Richie gave it a tune up on the Monday, so no great surprise. We marked the fish really well that day. That day, um, And the good thing Richie. about that is you... <laughs> we needed Richie. Well, you can we... yell at... You can, sorry, you can yell out to your crew, like if you mark him at 30 metres or 20 or 50 or whatever, you just you can yell out to your crew. That way they can get ready for the pitch and all the tees. And so that's, you know, it's... If you've got the manpower and the crew that are sort of know what they're doing, I mean, it helps heaps, doesn't it? Oh, the day 100%. we went out with three of us on the Friday, we did zeros. The day we go with Richie, we got 13. So, Being an unfamiliar boat, we actually went out on the Friday and we probably spent the first two hours swearing at the sounder trying to get it to function properly. Initially, we weren't even marking bait, but we got... Yeah. We managed to tune it up to the point where we were marking bait. But, yeah, it was something – I don't know what was going on, but we couldn't we, – we didn't mark a fish all weekend. And um, it was a good sound and a good transducer, so we obviously didn't have it tuned properly. So definitely should have given Richie a call. He would have He would have loved that. I bet he doesn't get too many calls, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't scared to jump on the sounder and start hitting buttons. So <laughs> the last time I did that in the tuna season, I bloody jammed the thing up and – had to get the unit sent to Sydney for fixing. So, oh, did you? But to Richie's credit, <laughs> he did the tuning, and there was there was no such issue. So um, you basically basically just mashed the keyboard, and then eventually just smoke started coming out, and <laughs> had to go back. Yeah, to the exactly. Crazy. Yeah, exactly. So hey, um, um, I won't touch it ever again. <laughs> did I hear that you've got some stats from the comp, Rodney? Entrances, Marlins Court, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we've got, got some numbers here. Um, we had a really good pre-entry, but because of the wind forecast for the weekend, we didn't really have any top-ups on the weekend. So I reckon we were probably 10 boats down on what we should have. So we had 26 boats um, registered. I think it was 111 anglers. So a pretty good ratio of anglers per boat. Um, 56 marlin officially registered in the comp. Uh, there were four disqualified. We had a boat come in a local crew that come in five minutes late on the last day and uh, unfortunately the way our rules are um, they were disqualified so that might be something we take to the committee this year to try and maybe give a bit extra time uh, after stop fishing for boats to finish catching their fish and get their tags in because that wasn't a great end to the tournament for that crew but well i do remember on the radio we we got the call i'm going to say about 2.30, that we were warned that, hey, think about start heading in if you want to make it in by, by the cutoff time. But, you know, I guess mm. the, 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 the wind comes up like all different boats are capable of getting in at uh, different times. Even if you do, do get the wrap-up at, what was it, 2.30 when we had to be in by, by 4? Was that correct? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was 3 o'clock stop fishing. That particular boat hooked up prior to it they caught the fish at 10 past three and they pushed in uh, i think there's definitely an argument we've had a fish to squall for the same issue a few years ago and that angler hasn't been back since so um, so if you so, if you're on a fish um like you, you still applies for you to be back in at the harbor at the same time even if you catch a fish close to the stop fishing time like um what is actually the rule yeah correct they've they've Got to have their cards in by four o'clock, and but at this stage, it hooked appears, up or not hooked up, you got to be in by four. Is that right? You got to be in. You got to be in by four. So, and it looks like there's not a lot of discretion on that. Um, so that's something I think as a committee. I mean, I think these tournaments. This is not a. This is not a big money tournament. It's for perpetual trophies, and obviously the crews get to take home a trophy as well. It's. It's really about the banter with your mates, a bit of history, and um, so it's you know it's not like we've got a hundred thousand dollars on the first place. You know what I mean? Oh, it was <laughs> a fantastic night at the Bermagui Country Club. We're just running some footage here of you str- strutting up to the stage and 
claiming your prize here, Rodney. Team Pandemonium taking the oh, stage. I love it. So we, is it? Who was on the boat? We, we, we've got Nico, yourself. We have Lockie O'Reilly. And we have Scott. And his father, Peter. Yep. Scott's father, Peter. No, no, Lockie's dad, oh, uh, Peter. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. I loved yep. uh, I loved and the different boats t shirts. Like every every boat like it like had a team and they all had their own apparel and there were some uh, cool looking uh boat t shirts which I was really impressed with. <laughs> yeah. Undertow apparel. We'll we'll give them a plug. They might come on next year. Yeah. Um they might make yeah, it, they it might make us a shirt. A, <laughs> well, you never know. Well, I'm <laughs> sure they would. Um but it's definitely a part of the part of the whole sort of program and a you know, a bit of banter and, yeah, it was good. I, I had mixed feelings with our win. I don't know why because it's the first time we've had, like, an open win like that. Um, but I guess when you're so close to it with the organisation, you probably feel you get a bit of advantage, like you get to know so many of the teams and your network's pretty wide. But, but that's well, okay. That There's opportunity for others to get more involved. Well, I, like, called a really good mate on Thursday night and I was like, oh, where's where are the fish biting? And he goes to me, oh. There's a competition on the weekend. And I said, oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> just throw me under the bus there, Dave. No, well, I actually, I was, I actually didn't. You just did. I never mentioned a name. The, the, the good thing was when you're coming with your five, five flags on Friday, I didn't have the heart to ask you where you got them. So I think you did. And I said, oh, it's a competition, Rodney, I'm afraid. I can't tell you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's all Love good. it. It's Love all it. good fun. So, Rodney, just um, you, you actually started fishing Bermagui when you were a, a young fella, didn't you? So, how have you seen the fishery progress since then? Has it improved? Well, it seems to be pretty well defined, doesn't it? I, I think in the old days, our weather forecasts were poor. We didn't, you know, we didn't have sort of temperature charts. Maybe we sort of we didn't concentrate our efforts enough to. Like back in the day, if we got a marlin for the season if we did a couple of trips up there we're happy with that um but nowadays you know you got boats up there this week that you know 10 20 for the week um so yeah it's definitely become a lot more specialized i think like we tried switching in the old days but we probably never pulled it off um it was either live baiting or lures pretty much you know skip baits weren't around people weren't doing it back then so it's definitely developed um, and becoming, you know, very competitive. Like just just over the tournament, so there were sixty marlin caught, twenty six boats. That's on average two per boat. That's pretty good fishing. Yeah, it um, is. We were actually teamed yeah, up the, with um, the Watermark crew, who are uh, winning against Tide Listeners. So shout out to you boys. And Mark what, Haley and crew. That's it. So it was quite funny because on the Saturday. They tagged two, and I think, I think it might have been three, actually, two or three, and then we came in and we said, oh, we've let the team down here, boys. And uh, Mark said to me, oh, it's all right because we'll let you down tomorrow. And funnily enough, yep, they got none, and then we tagged a couple. So uh, teamwork makes the dream work. We we sort of covered each other there. would have been nice if we all tagged them every so, day, though. <laughs> Mark, so is it? So, so is it? Sorry. Oh, no, that's all right. I'll say Mark's just joined us on the live feed. He said, great to hear about all the fish that were caught. Any chance we can talk about who won the most prizes in the raffle? Oh, actually, I'd like to lodge an appeal there, Rodney. The raffle. Yeah. I feel like we bought half the raffle tickets on <laughs> in existence on the Friday night and we won. We did. We had a full spread. It was like a like a like a circle of raffle tickets that just was. like trailed around the table like and we won some token measuring mat and uh and like a, a new south wales fisheries hat while the guys across the table from us just absolutely bagged out on prizes i think that there well there is a bit of yeah i think it was a bit of a story behind that <laughs> yeah. yeah because mark had made the big strategic move to to moor his boat for the weekend he's seven seven point six yellow fin in a like a 70 foot berth so he got the big fine on Sunday morning, and uh, to his credit, he paid up the hundred, which went into some extra raffle tickets, Dave. So I think that's oh. how partly he cleaned up. Oh. Um, he actually asked for it to be used as a prize for the entrance, but I I misheard him, and he got some extra tickets. So um, 
yeah, good job by that crew. So was there a miscommunication with the boat length and it was like a seven point something and run, they thought it was a 70 footer or something like that? Well, no, I just think Mark wanted to be sort of <laughs> on the be dock with boy. all the bigger <laughs> boats. He wanted to be with the big boys. and um, But anyway, he performed well. They got a marlin last year on the second day and uh, they got a couple the first day, as you mentioned. So... Um, yeah, did a great job. Uh, I really enjoyed meeting uh, Mark and the crew from uh, Watermark, the avid listeners of the podcast, and they did exceptionally well at the raffle. But what I was most impressed with was uh, on the Monday morning uh, coming out of uh, Bermagui, we we waltzed into the Bermagui Bakehouse and Mark strutted up to the counter and demanded two packs of donuts. And, uh, yeah, that was very impressive, that uh, bakery ordering. Oh, you just—it's like a man that knew that what he was doing. Yeah, you liked how definitive it was, did you, Joe? Yeah, he just he just knew what he wanted. It's not like you to bring things back to food. <laughs> to, to food. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you eating on Pandemonium, Rodney? Was there was there um, was there all sorts of high high end foods? Was it would have been cheese platters and wines oh, for sure. I imagine so. No, Marlon Row. Not really. But, <laughs> no, one of the fresh, freshly milked Marlon Row. <laughs> on a tag and release tournament. Now, one of the one of the local skippers there gave us some um, freshly made deer cabana, like spicy cabana. That that was sensational. Oh, um, there you go. But the big one for us are the Red Rock Deli chips. They they're hard to beat on the boat. Oh uh, yeah, I love just, the lime and cracked in, pepper in we're, chili. We're just common Smiths crinkle cutters. In our trailer boats. On the oh, we were rocking the barbecue shapes. Yeah, we were, like Reno it. was like a freaking marlin on a bait ball on those pizza shapes. I tell you what, <laughs> uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. No, so, all good. I've got a cup, couple of little maybe results here. I, I only gave you the broad ones before, but we had a good result for small fry. Um, who we got there? Um, Texas Gorn on La Dolce Vita. He he got a marlin. That's Unusual for a small fry to catch a marlin, so that's an angler under the age of twelve. Okay, oh, cool. Um, he got a couple, didn't he? On on yeah. fifteen, I heard on the radio. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was one, but yeah, on fifteen. Um, great, great effort from him. Obviously, Nicholas there, Casey Harris. She's a Latrobe Valley member. Forty thousand points. Uh, they're in the Caribbean. Twenty four. There was uh, a bit who of else a... we got? Yeah, Mark. There was a bit of a like Grammys Awards night moment there where the wrong person was given the award, actually. Yeah, so um, that's something we might, we might have to look at at the committee level. We might have oh, yeah. to double check results before we go giving trophies. So, um, no, go <laughs> and on. Uh, Marcus Hickey, pretty popular winner from Bass Strait Game Club. Marcus yeah. Rod Grabber Hickey, uh, 50,000 points on the, on the crew bent over. So that's the 24 Bass Straighter. Uh, they were fishing with you there, Dave. You and Joey there on the Sunday Arvo. They were. I heard that they were, they did about seventy-five kilometres an hour the whole way in to make the cutoff on the way on the way back in. <laughs> oh, did they? They fished. Yeah, that fished doesn't right surprise. To the death knock and then just hammers down. Yep, yep. Which it was so, quite um, sporty weather yeah. over the weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, you're going to have to get up there for the blue water because Mark, the Russian from Malakuta, he he rolls up in his big. I don't know, 1,200 horsepower <laughs> Cuda <Wow>. craft and <laughs> he bobs around bait fishing all day, but as soon as it's time to go in, you know all about it. He's that, is uh, he actually fishing for marl? Yeah, he fishes a tournament and then like even the Bass Traders and that, they'll be going in. He goes past them like they're sort of standing still. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had no That's idea. A sight to see. <laughs> and there was a, there was another result, yeah. uh, Rodney, if you can uh, remind us. that There was a Mako shark that was tagged. Is that right? Other, other species? Yeah, there was. The, the, yeah, that was the boat Rocky, um, Aaron Davidson, Mako, 3,400 points for that one. Yeah, so only the one Mako. Surely, there were a couple of dolphin fish as well. Surely they didn't catch that Mako on purpose, did they? Was that? It's probably t- taking a livey rig or something. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. Yeah. Oh, thank God I thought someone was purposely catching them. But did, oh. do, do Makos come up in your marlin spread? Yeah, now you get them all the time. Uh, yeah, like, okay. hmm. actually, I thought there was quite a lack of sharks eating the marlin. I suppose because we were skip baiting rather than <laughs> walking live baits. Normally, you just get like one or two a day up there. Yeah, I wonder if maybe the currents had something to do with it, Dave. 
because they can come in pretty hot this time of year, like for sure. I did also hear a report that the uh, the big bait trawler was uh, working out of those uh, numbers about thirty k south of Burmy that we were fishing on Sunday. So yeah, uh, what do you know about the the bait trawler that's out there? Oh, contentious. Mm. Yeah, it definitely come up on the Sunday Monday. I think um, the fishing's been pretty poor the last couple of days, so maybe that's the reason. There you go. And what do you make sorry, of the? Sorry, boys. I just. Just stirring with that one, but but obviously it is an issue. Like if the bait's built up and you've got another another you know resource trying to you know take the bait down, but the dolphins and things can do it too. You'll be out and there's huge bait everywhere, wall to wall on the sounder, and if you get a big pot of dolphins through, that that bait's gone. Yeah, dolphins so actually definitely... get through a bait quite quickly. I've seen that whilst uh, tuna fishing on on the southwest, you get a pot of dolphins through and they'll. They'll wipe out quite a sizable area of bait quite quickly. Wow. Yep, very effective feeders, the old they're... dolphins. What, you think they'll they'll chew plenty of it or do you think it, they just break it up? No, I think they eat quite a bit of it. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. Actually, the first fish we caught on Friday, it had we had like three seals trying to jump on the line and like like purposely trying to break the fish off. It was crazy. <laughs> Help the marlin. Yeah, I know. Like they're yeah, they're wildlife yeah. warrior seals. <laughs> but no. Yeah, it's it's fun it's funny how many times that you're hooked up to a marlin that the seals are, are around. So they must sort of obviously we know they work on the bait balls together and maybe sometimes when we're catching them on the troll that they're, you know, either pre or post bait ball action. That's why the marlin are up. There's calls on the live feed for a dolphin and seal cull. What's your thoughts on that one? <laughs> oh, geez. No. Is that Richie? No, it's not. not. It's actually Shane Lowry. <laughs> I think he's okay. the dolphins must be attacking his broom and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking crap now. Could be an issue. <laughs> Could be an issue. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I can finish up and let you move on to your next next bit. Yeah, wrap us up. Now, well done, Rodney. Massive congratulations. And I just want to make a point of saying a big thank you to everyone who helped organise the competition. Your beautiful wife, Christine, did a lot of it, as well as your daughter, Olivia, I saw, working away there, So, um, as well as yourself and many other other volunteers. So huge thanks to those guys. And yeah. for me personally, someone who back in the day was probably even slightly anti-competition because, you know, I felt like I was better chance of chasing the bite a bit more to actually participate yeah. in that competition and experience the camaraderie and um it helped that the fishing was red hot as well, but it was just fantastic. It does help. Yeah. It does. So, yeah, it was just fantastic to be a part of and a big thanks to yourself and everyone else involved there, Rodney. And Yeah. No, good on you, Dave. I appreciate that because, you know, it is a pretty dynamic fishery and maybe some people do see tournaments a little bit old school, but it just shows. And the quality of the entrance, like to get 60 fish, to like average a fish a day per boat, they're, they're good numbers. A hundred percent. And if anyone wants to win our ta- our successful tournament, not win, sorry, buy our successful tournament vessel with a pre pre marlin build, it is for sale currently. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hit us up and we'll uh, we'll work out a sweet deal for that one. Yeah, it's even got a bit of a discount code. Just discount code marlin bill. It's had a few marlin <laughs> alongside it, so it's a proven fish uh, catching machine. It's a fish razor. That's right. But uh, no, we'll let you go, Rodney. Thank you very much for coming on board tonight and we will chat to you shortly, my friend. Good on you. See you, boys. See you, mate. See you, Rod. Yeah. I had an absolute ball, Dave. So, yeah, the Alliance Game Fishing uh, Tag and Release Competition, it's it's on, on Labor Day weekend every year, I'm told. So it'll be on again next year. It'd be great to get a few more boats and uh, get around it next year. I'd, I'd love to go back. How about you? Apparently next year we're bringing a 760 Haynes, which is the biggest one in the fleet, the next one up, Joe. We're going bigger again, which will require a bigger tow car because <laughs> we towed this one up there with a Ram 1500, the spec up edition, petrol logo. What do you think our fuel usage was on the way up those big gold hills to Birmingham? Oh, me and the Ram, um, oh, gee, 
Uh, it's going to be a lot, you know. Uh, the pet, you know, everyone loves my petrol watch uh, segment, but I tell you what, I filled up at the Bowser the other day with ninety eight for my uh, lot, and it was uh, two dollars fifty four a liter. I'll tell you what, you want to be watching the <laughs> petrol in there because she's going out the, she's flowing out at a rapid rate of twenty nine <laughs> liters per hundred kilometers, Joe. So I've got a good friend. Absolutely that- frightening. I've got a good friend's got a Chev, and the Chev he reckons wasn't too bad on the, the fuel, but uh, yeah, the Rams seem to love the fuel. Diesel Chev? Yeah. Yeah. There's your difference. Petrol oh, okay. diesel. Oh, yeah. it's petrol, the Ram. I didn't know. Wow. Now, I actually saved your life on the way home. Yes, you did. Because <laughs> you were beginning to sleep drive yourself to death, and I jumped in there at Can River and... Whilst you were sleeping, I tested out the performance of your vehicle and she goes pretty well, Joe. Oh, mate, it was great. So before I, I started my journey to uh, Bermagui on the Saturday and um, I'd been performing at uh, Brighter Days Festival, as you can see. So I was up in the Alpine region. We we're doing a Billy Joel and Elton John songs. I just did the early slot from uh, 3 to uh, 4 p.m. there. And uh, then, yeah, I, uh, I then took the uh, the car I punched into my GPS how to get to Bermagui and it took me up off the back of Mount Hotham and it took the Tiguan R cycling event um, yeah, God. into into race mode and I just hooked it up and down uh, the uh, some of those uh, hills there and um, it was just absolutely stunning and up over Hotham and then across through the Tambo River and spat me out of Bruthen and I was on the uh, road to Bermagui and that Sapphire Coast. Beautiful, Joe. Yeah. And you probably do use a bit of fuel because I notice you leave your car in the race mode the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I do. When I was driving, you said, oh, you're in uh, economy mode. I said, yes, I'm driving economically. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't do that. I just now, hit the race button. <laughs> now, thanks for driving, Dave. I was um, pretty tired uh, you coming straight from uh, playing from the band and uh, getting into Bermagui late on Sunday morning and going fishing. Um, you've got to look after each other when you go on these long-range trips. Um Good to go with a few blokes and share the driving and just help each other out. So, yeah, always appreciate you. Thanks. No worries at all, my friend. Uh, Shane, oh no, it wasn't Shane. Simon has actually just noted Joseph behind us. We're dwindling in numbers of fish. What's going on there? Oh, yeah. Did we skip bait them on the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the webby there. The few, uh, these fish are getting a bit aggressive and they are, are actually attacking each other and I have lost a couple of fish in the last couple of weeks. It's not ideal. I'm even thinking of maybe switching out this uh, fish species to a new fish species. So I don't know. I've, I've had these fish here for seven years. It's just I'm just spread a little bit thinly over all the things I love doing and uh, fish keeping is probably not at the top of the list at the minute. Fish killing is your game, Joe, not keeping. <laughs> Murderer. So I want to do a quick tackle spotlight on the gear we ran, Joe, given that we are Shimano sponsored. Oh, we, yes, we so are. We're we, like, like, look at this photo here. Like, we are Shimano lovers. We love the gear. <laughs> we love Shimano. So without being too much of an advertisement, I did just for anyone who's looking to get into their mar- their marlin fishing, I want to point out a, cu- a little bit of the tackle that we were running, Joe. So uh, we had your standard uh Tiagra 50 WLRSs, which I've actually had those reels since 2013-ish. They're absolutely battle-hardened and they're still going strong. Look at that. I've got it front and center. But the lads recently sent us out these Shimano Speedmaster 37 kilo sticks, Joe, and I had just switched out them out from the old school Tiagra game rods, which I think everyone nearly had a set of those back in the day and um, I've ran them up until just recently and they're still an awesome rod but these Speedmasters were absolutely fantastic, Joe. Oh, you even didn't take the plastic off. It. That's how excited you were to use That's because that's, that's lucky. you keep you've got to keep it sheathed. It's lucky. <laughs> so, so they were fantastic to use, Joe. And then on our teasing and switching rods, we actually used a, a more lightweight setup which was the Tiernosses fitted with a, a Tagum uh, deep drop sword rod, which is a really light setup, perfect for pitching baits and um, switching fish. And uh, a lot of people also using like tel- telekas and stuff like that, just real lightweight stuff for doing that sort of work. We actually fish 37 kilo gear, but that's just because that's what we run for big tuna and stuff. But We love a good 37 kilo. Problem is in a competition, we then get less points for our tag and release. So 
Ideally, you'd probably want to be running 24 or even 15 kilo line on those fish. And then at the terminal end, we were running 300 pound moi moi on the skip baits and um, down to a Ona Mutu Tenno Circle, which I'm a really big fan of those hooks. I usually have really good hookup rates on them. They're deathly sharp. And on the live bait rigs, dropped down to 200 pound moi moi and the same hooks, Joey. So, um, a little bit of a run through of the setup for you. That was Joseph. nice. I enjoyed that. Brought to you by Shimano Australia. Yep, yep. We love them. Now, on the Marlin theme, Joe, there's been the, uh, quite the Marlin invasion down there in Tasmania. I heard about that. You informed me on the boat on the weekend that there's been quite a lot off the St. Helens area. St. Helens, and I'm told even some fish and lost down all the way down there at Eagle Hawk Neck, Joe. Yeah. Which is quite a way south indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and hasn't probably seen been seen for quite a few years. So they did actually used to get the odd one down that way as well as Yellowfin. Yep. Um, but, yes, the, the current in the EAC is pushing down incredibly hard this year and we are seeing some fish caught down there uh, as we speak, which is really cool to see. So... There was one caught yesterday by India India Thompson of uh, of Tuna Champions fame. Her father caught one, and then there was another one caught in a competition there about a week ago as well. So, and oh, good friend of the show, Leo Miller, Joe. Apparently, yesterday he went skip baiting down there in Tassie and 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 raised two fish into his spread. So that's pretty cool. Yep, that's right. Twenty one degrees of water. Uh, there he is, and uh, that's his sounder there. Um, of uh, yeah, looking for marlin there. So reasonable bait stacking up. Actually, I've just been reminded, Joe. I've got to mention the the lures that caught the caught and raised the marlin as well. A good mate, Dave Jurisic, Snoop Doggy Dog. He always helps us out with our lures, and we had a bite on the and I don't know. Uh, pink Panther is pink, the pink one. Pink Panther is the one that nailed the fish. Yep. But we actually raised one and, and had a bite on the little white bait guy at the bottom there. Oh, beautiful. Which I actually don't know what that's called, Dave. Sorry. You'll probably inform me in a second. Yep. It'll be in the chat. But um, yeah, no, they, uh, they did the job nicely. They got some fish up in the spread. So we were running the lures until we actually had located where the marlin were, right? Well, because it was so windy and it was pumping from the north, we were making bait, bug oral headway when we were skip baiting into the current. So I thought while we're going up current, we'll run some lures, we can push that a little bit quicker and the baits aren't going to flip around and and foul themselves. So that's what we did and that's how we actually pulled our first fish, Joe. It was. And then after that, when we went skip baiting, we were, as Rodney mentioned, running across the current and that's how we got our baits to stay in the water a little bit better. So that smaller one there is called a sli- crystal slant. It's a six-inch lure and I actually intentionally ran smaller lures in order to get a better hookup. So the marlin would actually properly eat the lure, Joe. Yep. We enjoy uh, Dave Jurisic's uh, lures uh, from uh, Bass Strait Lures. He's got uh, all, all sorts of uh, tuna lures, especially at the moment, um, you know, they're school tuna and there's, they're, they're chewing on a lot of white bait and he's got some perfect little white bait skirts which have been absolute dynamite on the local tuna. But, um, yeah, they do catch marlin, his uh, skirts as well. And he's very good at tiling as well. Dave. So, <laughs> he probably doesn't want me telling anyone that because I don't think he really likes the tiling. I think he likes the lures, but uh, yeah, I am looking forward to some uh, Dave Jurisic Bass Strait lures splashbacks in my kitchen soon. That'll be fantastic. Well, you know what, Davey? It's almost barrel season, so you're going to have to stock up again. I am. We actually lost a couple last year, so no, we're looking forward to that, Joe. Now, you were looking at the bait we are catching on the weekend, and yes. you actually got quite ravenous because you thought that looked pretty good. I did. Uh, so naturally when you go marlin fishing, you have to go and catch some live mackerel. And I, I'd been searching up uh, um, marlin fishing prior to our trip, but Instagram must just instantly know that I love food and it just started spamming me with all of these uh, delicious ways of how to So. Yeah, I discovered that uh, a beautiful butterfly char-grilled mackerel with thing mackerel and chips and have a look at that up on your screen, Davey. Like, 
holy shamoli, like that actually looks bloody beautiful. Can you imagine how that would skip along the surface? We could tow that for Marlins. Do, do you reckon the Marlins were uh, char grilled or uh, not char grilled? Oh, you'd be mad not to, wouldn't you? That does look bloody amazing, Joe. <laughs> look that salad. But uh, yeah, they call that blue when they serve. Have a look at it. That's that is just you're actually right. That is Man, ready to have a freaking eagle claw, uh, freaking uh, circle hook, and you could just skip that barbecued beautifully in the white wash. I could put a stitch straight through that nose, and then she would flap along beautifully. And the char grill would bring the fish on. I think. They oh, they love the smoke flavor. So I noticed they call that a blue mackerel whenever they serve slimy mackerel. Do you think that's to remove the stigma of eating bait fish? We just name it something else. I don't know, but. Have you ever eaten them before, Dave? I have, yeah. I've had them smoked a few times. They're actually really nice being an oily fish. And I think grilled like that, if you burn ice them and then grilled them, they'd be really good. They'd be, have that nice crispness. So there's there's a lot to be said for eating um, what we would call bait, Joe, because obviously it's such a huge biomass of fish in the ocean and they're very fast growing and they replenish very quickly. So it is actually quite a good thing to be eating what we would deem as bait fish. Well, uh, I've uh, got an update as well uh, from uh, Dennis Delasil, a good mate of mine. He he loves uh, catching uh, yakkers and uh, slimies. He had a good day on them. And uh, he was actually telling me with yakkers, you can put them in the pressure cooker and it actually dissolves the bones in the pressure cooker. You can just have like beautiful steamed fish um, with rice and um and apparently it's really delicious. Have you ever eaten yakas before? Yeah, I've had them just pan fried and the fillets dusted in flour, Joe. And they're very nice. Man, how come you've been holding out on me? Like, <laughs> because I haven't too, eaten a yakka. I'm too lazy to clean them these days. Yeah. But, but well, yeah. you don't have to clean them. You just put them in the pressure cooker and it instant dissolves the bones, apparently. Yeah, I don't know about that technique. That sounds a bit odd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hopefully you didn't get any pesky whiting in amongst these bait fish catch there, Joe. That would have been pretty upset. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been but, pretty uh, upsetting. But yeah, no, uh, the, the barbecued mackerel sounds good. Like, mm. Mm. might try that one on my little smoking Joe, little 30 centimeter uh, webbecue there next time. Definitely can attest that it's good smoked, but I imagine if you were good at cooking, you would make that taste absolutely delicious as well. Yeah. Now, Joe, there's another Marlin tournament going on right now. Yes, there is. It's called, they're calling it the biggest game fishing tournament in the world. And it's just started yesterday, I believe. It's at a place called Wittianga in New Zealand, and it's the Kubota Marlin Fishing Tournament. Yes, yes, it is. It's uh, in Mercury Bay, and there's all the boats taking off. It looks absolutely huge. So there is a million dollars worth of prizes up for grabs in this one, Joe. And There's a lot of boats there. <laughs> you can just see the amount of boats <laughs> screaming out to the ocean there is absolutely insane. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's gonna flip there. It's like the Ganguly's River. Can you imagine in India? The, could you imagine the wake? <laughs> yeah, I can see it. There's little boats that are, uh, yeah. But look at that poor little boat. They're bobbing around in the water. Well, that's actually not a little boat. It's a quite a sizable one. It's but like a seven so and a half many, meter. So many jumps there. <laughs> so yeah, as we know, I used to actually work for Kubota. So snuzzle, snuzzle a free game fishing trip. Yeah. Uh, that's good. So, yeah, that's uh, apparently the biggest game in the world, and it runs from the 14th to the 16th. There is, and, you know, we've covered it before. There's even some big competitions like in America as well where there's millions of dollars worth of prize. But if you're saying it's the, the biggest and the best, then I'm going to go with that. Well, I'm dubious, but that's they're self-claiming that. So ah, okay. what do you do? I can't question that. It's like a self-claiming five-star hotel, right? A hundred percent. Now, we had a quick little update from Peter Ferguson, who's our man on the ground in the news, Joe. Yes. Apparently, they mentioned this evening, and this relates to our wind turbine saga that's been going on for some months, that uh, from April 1st, solar and wind-powered projects will be deemed essential and they can be fast-tracked with no appeal. So, word is that the... Proposed wind turbine areas have been reduced, but they are still going to go ahead is what I'm hearing, Joseph. Oh, that's no good. So there is much more to play out there. That's an ever-evolving one. We are anti-wind wind 
turbine on this show. I am. We are. We are. We're going to say it. We don't want them in We don't the, want them. No. We don't Ta- want them to ruin our fishing. Right in our fishing zone. Yeah. No, I just think even walking along the shore, you don't want to see those giant pieces of crap in the, in the ocean. And the environmental impact is completely unknown. There is some evidence that suggests with overseas projects that it's not good. So... Anyway, we will continue to keep an eye on that one, and um, as details come, details come to light, we'll we'll keep an eye out. Uh, keep an eye out there, Joey. Absolutely. You uh, had an update, an injury update, I believe. Uh, I did. Um, yeah, uh, Reno Prabanda. He had a beautiful uh, marlin scar from the weekend um, up on his screen. There, can you believe? He, you know, the the poor fella had been hanging over the. The side door um, opened up in the 725 Haynes and um, he'd been bobbing up and down and hanging onto a marlin and he was even having trouble to breathe in, the poor poor fellow. He said he thought he might have bruised or cracked a rib, but not only was his ribs the problem, he'd had two very bruised sore arms from a thrashing striped marlin. And I guess that's what happens when you go and catch five marlin in one day. You're going to get thrashed around a little bit. So this is like basically your sports injury update because we have Reno with his arm whinging about getting bashed. Um, apparently we've got some broadcasting issues again, but we shall push on. That's okay because we've got the audio feed. <laughs> we had Reno getting bashed and his arm bruising up and then Jonah. Have you got the Jonah photos? Because I do. He was untangling a sword rig out there in Tasmania and the line drifted into the propeller of the boat wrapped around his fingers and ripped his hand into the gunnel. Ouch. And crushed his fingers, Joe. Very Holy nasty crap. injury. Is that just uh, like uh, simulcasted that he's wrapped the, the line around to take the, the picture or did they just wrap up the line in a bandage all at once? Mm, I do hope you're joking. <laughs> I do really hope you're joking. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm jo- I am joking. <laughs> you're the one who's hard to know if you're joking. No. You are You are as dry as with your sense of humour. And now I, maybe I'm trying a bit of your humour back on you and you don't believe me. <laughs> Absolutely concerning. So he reckons if it had a – his mate pulled the boat out of gear. If it had a sailing gear, his arm would have probably got ripped, really badly crushed. So – he got away with it there, so that's your injury updates from winning against Todd for the week. Yeah, be safe out there. Fishing lines, hooks, boats. Uh, yeah, it can all go very wrong out there. I'm starting to lose my throat again here, Joey. I've been hit with another daycare disease. Oh, okay. Which frequently happens, but how about we run through the hookup? Yeah, let's do it because there's actually, it's a meaty kind of hookup this week. She's a bit meaty. <laughs> Welcome to The Hookup, where we go around Australia and indeed the world for the freshest fishing reports. We're going to go uh, straight to back down to Tasmania. Uh, Jonah Yick has been absolutely dominating the inshore and here he is pictured now with a giant fish. Is that the smallest kingfish you've ever seen, Joe? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like it's, it's small. Jason Taylor would absolutely froth on that, wouldn't he? Would he? Yeah, he'd love it. It's all well, well, it's not even impressive to catch a big one. Try catching one that small. So apparently Jonah, for those that are viewing this, that's a kingfish that's literally about 20 centimetres long. And Jonah caught that way offshore on the shelf out of Eagle Hook Neck, and, which is not uncommon for small kingfish to be under structure out on the um on the shelf there. Well, it isn't. I had a good mate, uh, Sean Hildyard. He went over to uh, San Diego, and they've got charters that run out of there on just open runabout boats to cast plastics and lures. And they're going out into the ocean looking for the kelp patties. Uh, there's there's kelp patties out on the shelf, and it's actually a thing that a uh, little juvenile kingfish and dolphin fish hang under these kelp patties uh, for for shelter out there. They call them no. Well, they call them yellowtail over there, Joe. Yeah, they do. They're actually not that juvenile. They're quite reasonable fish. Yeah, but very similar to what Jonah's just experienced there. What else did he catch, Joe? Oh, he's caught quite quite a number of fish. Um, he well, he did get some big kingfish as well. 
Um, there, there he is. Freaking beautiful specimen of a kingfish there. He's catching more kingfish than us at the minute. Yeah, that's not real hard. But, yeah, he's <laughs> he's become quite the king the king master. Fishing in the inshore rivers and estuaries there. So And some fantastic snapper um, also there as well. He's uh, done well. Which... Which is also very cool because that's quite close to... Oh, look, he's even holding it with his bandaged up hand there, the poor fella. Ah, uh, look, you can see my old oven shelf behind him from when I used to have an oven in the boat <laughs> that Jonah just kind of broke within two minutes. Yeah, and he got the daily double as well, uh, Jonah. Look, even... He's a beautiful snapper and a beautiful king there. He's done really, really well. Well done, Jonah. Is that a secret location where he caught it from? No, I think he was just literally in the Derwent. What I can tell. Oh, wow. The Derwent's the one down south, isn't it? Remind you, idiot. I'm not the best uh, Tas- Tasmanian uh, geographist. The one that goes through Hobart. I'm pretty sure that that's right. Okay. I hope I'm not wrong. So, yeah, well done, Jonah. And we've already mentioned the, the Marlins going on down there. So, I reckon we might see a few of them. Everyone in the, everyone down there seems to be rigging up for Marlin and they're going to give that a crack. So, I reckon we'll see, see some more caught. Yeah, absolutely. Boats venturing out for swordfish. Actually, Tasmania swordfish been a few caught in the last few weeks, by the way. Is it really? Mm-hmm. Boats venturing out of Victoria. I've heard they've, there's been giant GTs encountered, Joe. Oh, is that? it is pretty warm at the minute, so. The lion biting toads. I'm the, told they're back. The giant toads are back, are they? They ruin everyone's swordfish gear. This is just a whisper. If anyone can confirm that, we'd love to know, but. Yeah, apparently they're back. And I, n- I, I never heard you guys complaining about the toads back in the day when you started sword fishing. Is is it is there less swordfish or just more toads? I've never had a toad bite, bite off ever. Uh, I haven't really done much in the last couple of years, but it certainly seems to have become an issue in the last three or so years, Joe. Mm-hmm. Guys are losing three, four setups in a day, which that's thousands of meters of braid and becomes very expensive, as that, you can imagine. That is no bueno, my friend. No bueno at all. Uh, <laughs> good friend of the show, Jason Taylor's been smacking the kingfish. Jason's entire identity is kingfish, so that's not surprising. <laughs> no, he absolutely loves them, old Jace. So congratulations to him. Did we have any photos of MJ or not? I'm um, not handy, no, but I did see them. Very good. Uh, couldn't tell you where he was because he yeah, wouldn't King, tell her. Kingfish Mafia, keep it a secret. Kingfish Mafia. But congratulations to him. Still plenty of kings around in Victoria. Uh, local tuna going nuts as usual. Yes, they're still ravaging along. Locally, but you've actually had a report down there from Port Ferry. I have. Uh, Sean Hildyard, he went out off the back of Julia Reef and he fished two days and he caught 22 tuna for uh, Saturday and Sunday um, off a very small concentrated patch off the back of Julia Reef. Um, they... He got them on a little red uh, stick bait uh, and a few on the popper and a couple on the metal slug. Yes, Joe, a very little stick bait coursed into the fush. <laughs> and they raced on home. Babe. They raced on in on the lure. <laughs> uh, no, there's good, uh, there's good tuna down the West Coast as well. Um, also, a report that I really enjoyed this week, uh, Sean Ferdier of Think Big Fishing Charters, he took – out a group and they were catching flathead in Bass Strait. And this is the time of year where you do catch some uh, lovely flathead off our local waters. And uh, if you really concentrate your efforts, you can really knock yourself up a, a bag of uh, tasty seafood and stop on your screen there. Now there's there's some uh, lovely flathead. And have a look at that. That's, uh, yeah. What are, which flathead are they? Is that a tiger flathead, Dave? That is a tiger flathead, Joe. Large tiger flathead. Great. That's I'm I'm glad um, that's been fact checked for me. But uh, yeah, lovely tiger flathead, and that just looks like a that just looks like a good time. I'm going to say, Dave. I'd love I'd love some uh, flatty tails rolled in some uh, batter and oil and some chips. That would be just fantastic. They are very much underrated fish to eat. The flathead. Those tiger flathead generally caught. Quite deep, 60, 70 meters. Yeah. And huh? they've actually got really big teeth. Yes, they do. That's why they're called a uh, tiger. Um, also, down on that western entrance of Western Port, had uh, Uncle Tony send us in a report. Um, 
the pinkies have started up at boy one. So be interested in getting some pinkies. They only got half a dozen on Wednesday in some uh, swelly and rough conditions, but uh, he did say they were excellent size. And, you, you know, do get a little, yeah, you get this late run of pinkies at boy number one on Western Port there. And there you go up on the screen there. Good sized, he said. So, yeah, that is also some also qual- delicious quality seafood there as well. So if you are just looking for a feed at the moment, the local waters has got some very tasty delicacy. Maybe not the glory big game fish species, but uh, th- those small pinkies are absolutely sensational eating, as were those flathead that we saw from Sean there. As, as my father would say to me, Joe, he goes, Joe, I just want to go out there and catch some fish that I can eat. I just want to go out there and catch some fish that I can eat. Doesn't care about how hard they pull or how big they are. He just wants to eat some fresh fish. Well, he's lying to himself. He wants the glory, all right? <laughs> now, a lot of people do feel that way. And I actually am swinging that way myself, Joe, because fish is delicious, as we know. It is. We, we had a beautiful fish uh, pre-podcasting dinner tonight. We did. It was a uh, disease-ridden farm salmon. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. delicious. I've Lovely King, crispy skin salmon. I've got a King Kong, Donkey Kong, Joey. Oh, okay, we're going to ring the bell. King Kong, Donkey Kong, mate. Look. <laughs> what do you got for us, Davey? I don't have heaps of details here because I just remembered it then. But here we go. It's a massive King George Whiting out of Western Port. I'm going to hit play on this one. Oh, it's 60 centimetres. It's, oh, it's got to be a it's, snapper. It's 58 centimetres. Oh, I think it's. I think and hey, weighed, that's, hey, that's Gordon Ramsay. That's actually <laughs> that's Gordon Ramsay. He went whiting fishing. It's a fucking whiting. <laughs> um, it actually weighed one point six kilograms. How's that, mate? This guy's Gordon Ramsay. I think that's more impressive. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's a fantastic no, one, whiting. One point six kilo. That's huge. That's King Kong, Donkey Kong of the yeah. ye- of the King, year, Joseph. King. King. King Kong, Donkey Kong, mate. Look at this. Cyril just impressed. That was an absolute remix. <laughs> oh, but there it is on the scale. That, that is an absolute Mate, take. you need to get a rope and hang that up on a gantry. Look at it. He's got two He's got two hands trying to fit around it. It's so wide. You'd be mad not to back your boat under the big gantry there at Hastings <laughs> and, and hoist that thing in the air for the world to see, Joe. Yeah. One, 1. 1.6 kilo of whiting. Yeah, that's awesome. They generally say a whiting over a kilo is absolutely enormous, but that is uh, that's just next level that thing. And uh, thank God it's no longer in the ocean terrorizing pippies. You did say, say you did say that you'd be interested to go down to Tassie sometime and go and catch some of those uh, large whiting. Oh, it looks like I don't need to anymore. Nah. So that's absolutely sensational. Congratulations. Well, it looks like we need to go fishing for some just some good fish that we can eat, as my dad would say. We do. Uh, just a couple of questions here. Do we plan on doing windy inside bumper stickers for cars and boats, etc.? Yeah. Should we, Joseph? Yeah, I think so. I think we should. We'll look into that one. And uh, looking at this weekend, is it worth driving past Eden to fish Burmy? <laughs> well, oh, well, that may I? You may. Or. Okay. Uh, on Tuesday, I've got a report out of uh, Tathra that. Um, a boat went five fish out at 42. So, yeah, that's out of Tathra. But uh, that's four, we did. That's middle numbers 42 south, isn't it, Joe? Yep. Yep. But uh, you did make some comments that you felt that the current was pushing the bait south at the moment, Davey. Well, I actually was quite keen to fish out of Eden on the way home on Monday. But uh, as it happened, we didn't get to. But I felt, yeah, I do feel like there's going to be good numbers of fish on that current foot pushing south. And um, Bermagui has seen the bulk of the boats, but I reckon there's definitely been some reports coming out of Eden Way, so I would definitely worth a crack down there, Joseph. Oh, and it's not, you know, from us Victorians, like Metro, like what, six and a half hours? My land speed record to Eden was five hours and 59 minutes. That's quick, man. Telling the old bar crusher with a 200 series land cruiser. Wow. Absolutely on it. Cannibal. 3 a.m. in the morning, eyes wide open. It's a classic cannonball. Foot to the floor, wind blowing through the hair when I had hair. 
<laughs> and just absolutely live in life and just beat that six-hour mark. Nothing better. Didn't yeah. have to catch a single fish after that. That's lovely. Trip made. Reminiscing. All right, Joseph, we've covered all there is to cover, I believe, unless you've got anything else you want to add, anything you want to wrap up. No, it's um, it's been a good show. I friggin' loved going up to Bermagui. I hope to do it. I'd, I'd love to get another trip in before the end of the season, but um, it's, yeah, we will see how we go. But I'd love to get up there next year for sure. And well, uh, yeah. I've got a small child due mid next month. So, yeah, you've uh, is looking rather unlikely. Looks like you're uh, successfully spawned again, Dave. I have. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Look forward to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very exciting, Joe. That is. One thing I will add is if anybody wants to come and come for a ride on some Haynes Hunter boats, I will be at Hastings tomorrow and Cows on Phillip Island on Saturday. We're going to have four boats there ready to yeah. rumble. Crazy deals going on, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to put that up on your screen right now. There we go. Uh, Mully's Marine has got the Haynes Hunter open day. There's a 525 Prowler, 565R, 595 Offshore, and a 625 Enclosed. We've actually deleted the 625 and we've replaced it with the 725, Ooh, the Marlin boat. Upgraded. I yep, love that. Um, today was at Patterson Lakes, but tomorrow, March 15th, Hastings boat ramp and March the 16th, the cows boat ramp and the session times are from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Yep. So come on down, say good day. Look forward to seeing everyone down there, Joe. Jump on a Haynes Hunter and look like a hero and just you're giving people an like experience. A you're giving people their experience. You should actually ask them when they rock up to the boat dealership. It's like, are you looking to purchase today or are you looking for an experience? Well, yes, actually, I need some sales tips off you, Joe, because you're an <laughs> No, That's but what they say at Porsche. Like if anyone is in the market, like the, the, the prices are quite ridiculous. The boss has gone crazy. So. When, when you go to uh, buy a Porsche, they ask you, are you looking to purchase or are you looking for an experience? Mm. Mm. What's the difference? Can't I purchase it and not have an experience? I don't know. What happens if I say I'm looking for an experience? Do I have to pay for it? No, you get to go for a test drive and get to instill the dream and then you'll be just thinking about that Porsche for, until you can find the money to go and get one. Oh, okay. So I love what you're doing. You're instilling the Haynes Hunter dream into people on your open days. Very good. And you get Joe as well apparently. Yeah. <laughs> 50% off for 725. No, I've taken a dollar off for each Marlin bill, though. Marlin <laughs> bill's no, they came right out. Don't worry about that. Yeah, it buffed right out. It, it did. It actually buffed right out. Yeah, lovely. Pathetic Marlins. Couldn't even penetrate the gel coat. <laughs> anyway, Joe, we've rambled on long enough. I'm starting to lose my voice. So we're going to uh, wrap it up for another week. Thank you guys who have joined us. Thank you, Rodney Gillum. And uh, we will be back. We'll see you next time, fishing friends. Good evening.